Amen. <coughs> so, thank you very much. So, how many here have ever found themselves kind of in an odd situation and, you know, you're kind of maybe in a, like a strange, uh, you know, like if you've gone down, if you've ever gone down the road like the wrong way, you notice it's a long way, you've never done that. Okay, you don't have to admit it. Okay, it's just kind of a really weird feeling. Like, and then, especially when the cars start coming at you, it's kind of a strange feeling. Or, for instance, like, let's just pretend, hypothetically pretend, that maybe you misread, like, a text or something, something you a text or someone, you know. Or worse, maybe even an email. I can't even imagine how somebody could misread an email. But anyways, but it's just kind of a weird feeling, like, wow, what is going on here? You know, like, I, I misread that, I'm going down the wrong way. Well, I want to share a little story with you. And first of all, I want to put a disclaimer on this. I don't advocate this game. This game is not good for little kids. But this is the way it was back in the 60s, way, way back then. I was in the sixth grade. We had this game we played, and it was called Kill the Guy with the Ball. Simple. I don't know if you ever remember that. All right, some of you do. And it was just simple. You know, you just you, you grab this ball, and, and you hang on to it for dear life. And the other guys would come and they would try to destroy you and get the ball. Okay, I mean, it was just all out, I guess like rugby, but even on steroids, right? Well, one day, I'm in the sixth grade, the ball comes to me, grab the ball, <coughs> I start running. And there was a setup, there was three guys, there was one guy in front of me who did a dive right in front of me caused me to fall. The other two guys conveniently came up and need me right in the rib cage. Boom! Knocked the wind out of me. Now, did I hang out to the ball? Of course I did. I don't know. <laughs> you don't let go of the ball. You just don't let go of it. So I'm laying there gasping for breath. and see all these faces around. And next thing you know, they're hauling me off to the hospital. And they, I had some bruised and busted cracked ribs. And they thought my spleen was ruptured or punctured. But man, I, I had the ball. You know, I mean, it was, it was glorious. <laughs> so, anyways, the story goes that the principal of the sixth grade um, class, his name was Jerome McCarthy. And he took a man out on this. I mean, he just honed in, found those culprits that tripped me, the two guys that need me, busted my ribs and all that, and he just went on a man hunt. He found him, hauled him into the office. You're out of here, you're suspended for, I don't know, I don't know if it was a week or whatever. And I'll never <coughs> forget that. So that's sixth grade. Go ahead to like sixth morning, you know, twelfth grade, and you graduated and just kind of wondering what's going on. And, all of a sudden, I hear that my sixth grade principal died, passed away. I said, oh man, I just love that guy, especially he just had a way about him. And uh, so, so I, I gotta go to the, I wanna go to the wake and, and, and pay my respects. So I went into this massive, massive funeral home. It was just monstrous. And there was like basically several, several people there, you know, viewings. So I walk in, I see the sign. Drew him a coffee and an arrow and I said, okay, so I I head over there and and I'm just I'm just recalling and thinking about you know the day that you know held onto that ball and the guys need me. I went to the hospital and I remember you know Jerome just you know all these memories are coming up in my head. And so with this big, big long line, I was like, wow, well, this is good. A lot of people here paying their respects. And so I kept walking up, walking up, and I got within sight of, of the casket, and uh, all of a sudden I noticed that Mr. McCarthy had turned into a missus. I was in the wrong line. I was in the wrong... See, so it started back then. It started back then, years ago, that I just ended up in the wrong place or whatever. But what a weird feeling. I mean, it was like... And I remember sharing this with somebody said, oh, did you just walk out? I'm like, no, I'm in this huge line. There's all these people. Well, let me tell you, my prayer life got 
correct it really quick. <laughs> I'm standing there going, oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, I hope they don't ask me, you know, how, how do you know when you spread, you know? So I'm going up sweating, and I get up there, and I said, I'm so sorry. You know, my condolences to you. I'm so sorry for your loss, and it's oh, okay. And that was it. I walked, I walked away. I'm like, thank you, Lord. So, but to my defense, I think the sign got turned around a little bit. Anyways, so it was just really a weird feeling, you know, that was very strange, and, and I'm sure you've had things like that happen to you. Well, there's things that happen to us in life, and I want in the next two weeks I want to look into the Book of James, and we're gonna we're gonna study the Book of James and look at it from a biblical standpoint how we handle trials, how we handle trials. Because if you're not in one right now, um, I don't want to be a doom and gloomer, but guess what? There's going to be one coming. Uh, if you've just gotten out of a trial, praise God, you got through it, but unfortunately life happens and there's probably going to be another one around the corner. So I, wanna, I want us to look uh, from the scripture, I want us to look biblically how we handle trials and tribulations. All right? So that would, be, that would be the first question, right up on the board. How do you react to trials? Now, if you have an elephant almost sitting on your car, and that could really be kind of a, a trial. But seriously, how would you react to that? Um, last week, is from process of elimination, I'm the guy who misread the email, and I was supposed to be up there, and I'm telling you, that was a strange, that was a bit of a trial, because it was just like, but Rusty used his gift, gifting and preaching, which I appreciate, and, uh, and it just kind of went off without a hitch, and God used that. And, but I understood, I understood that it wasn't done maliciously, it wasn't done on purpose, but God had ordained that for me to slide out of the way for Rusty to come in and just and preach that message. And so understanding that is very, very helpful. So how do you react um, to trials? <coughs> so let's look, James 1, 2, it says, this is NLT, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way. Consider it an opportunity for great, you know the next one? Yeah. So this is kind of how I picture it, that, you know, joy. We've got close pins, you know. Okay, I'm, I'm having joy. Um, I used to, when I was um, a little younger, uh, Kids would come up and oh, Mr. Brown, you know, the camp, and oh, how you doing? And I'm, oh, I'm pretty good for an old geezer, I'd say that. And it's, oh, you're not an old geezer. Now, today, I just give a polite laugh, you know? <laughs> yeah, so anyways, um, but I think, I think of this joy, you know, and it's like, is it a, a fake joy? Is it a, is it a plastic joy? Is it just literally, we got our cheeks pinned back by uh, clothes pins? So one of the things we can do, and we're going to go through this, uh, the first verses here, and James is writing to believers. But one of the things that really, really will help us is understanding who God is. And when we understand who God is, it will bring stability to our souls. So I don't know if you remember it was last year, whatever, when we preached on when I preached on the uh, the universe and how God created that, everything in the heavens and the earth, and how He has everything all ordained and in order. When you understand that, you you just understand that um, just the enormity of that. It is just breathtaking to just even realize that God can actually be in control of everything. Now. We can't help it that there's sin abounding in the world and that sinful hearts are going to lean towards their sinful nature. But understanding God is going to bring stability to your soul. So, a few years ago, my lovely wife made a sign. And I love the names of God. Uh, just love them because it just it accentuates and brings out His glory. It brings out everything. So she made this sign. And uh, for Christmas, and so it's all hand done, and it's right in our bathroom. All right. So every time I walk in there, which is quite often, uh, <laughs> here's the names of God right there, right on the wall. 
And so I try to like I try to look at you know different ones, and I try to just study that a little bit and go, Wow, God, you are a merciful God. You know, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. You're the Prince of Peace. Uh, you know, you are the solid rock. You're the Lord of Lords, God over all. And you just, you know, Lord of glory, Lord of hosts, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, you are the help to die. And, and just, it's just amazing. There's well over 100 names, I believe, on here. And so by understanding that, by seeing that, you start to realize that I'm not that big. <laughs> God is in control. God knows what he's doing. He knows, and when trials come your way, He knows what's going on. Um, are they fun? No, they're, they're not fun, but He knows what's going on. So here's a couple of uh, principles, some daily life principles that um, I like to live by. So very simple, very basic. God is holy, we're not. God is holy, and we are not. It is just, we can try to become as holy as possible through the Word of God, through the Holy Spirit, but until we see Christ, we are not going to be sinless, we are not going to uh, enjoy uh, just a sin-free life until we see Jesus. So God is holy. We're not, we saying about that today. God is sovereign. He knows all. We're not, we, we are not sovereign. We don't know all. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to turn on the news and get instantly depressed and see what's going on in the world, to see the, um, the battles that are going on in the world. And I don't know if you realize this or not, and I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but brothers and sisters, and I'm speaking to brothers and sisters this morning, we are in a battle. We are in a warfare. Um, did you realize that, the, that Satan didn't want you to come here today? Did you realize that he doesn't want you to read your Bible? He doesn't want you to have fellowship? He wants to whisper in lies. Because why? The Bible says that he is the father of lies. All right. He will sprinkle, as we saw when, uh, when the Holy Spirit brought Jesus up and be tempted on the mount. And then the, the devil actually knew scripture. So he would sprinkle lie and truth in there and then challenge Jesus. And how did Jesus respond every time? With scripture. Every time. So there, there's a lesson to be learned that when we are tempted, when we are in a deep trial, then we can reach into scripture and just quote that right back. Uh, we had a saying up at the camp and we would just tell the kids, you know, just... <coughs> Gets you know Satan off your back to the thing. We tell them just go guard with some peanut butter, you know. Just go guard with some peanut butter and just you know get out of my life type of thing. And uh, but anyway, so so God is holy. We're not. God is sovereign. Uh, God is sinless. Obviously, we're not. Uh, some people will try to preach sinless perfection when you're saved. I don't believe that. I don't believe Scripture backs that up. I believe that we are. Our sinful nature is still uh, within us. We have the Holy Spirit uh, that can certainly guide us, and uh, we can confess. Why would First John one nine be in the Bible, right? If we had sinless perfection, you know, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why would that be in there if we didn't need, you know, if we had sinless perfection? So God is sinless. We're not. <clears throat> God gives us the very air that we um, The older I get, the more I appreciate health, the more I appreciate life. Uh, and recently we were um, in Argentina visiting our um, daughter, son-in-law, and four grandchildren. And uh, we went, my son-in-law took, uh, took me dove hunting. And that was a lot of fun. I, I'm telling you right now, it was a lot of fun. But, to get from point A to point B, we ended up in this, following this pickup truck. And right now, over in Argentina, it is winter. So we're now in like this monsoon season here. Everything's wet and lakes are filling up. Over there, it's dry as a bone. 
and we followed this pickup truck to find, you know, out, we were out in the middle of a field, uh, thousands and thousands of acres waiting for the dust to come over. But we spent <coughs> 45 minutes down this dusty, dusty, dusty road. Um, I mean, just horrific fact to the point where we backed off about a quarter of a mile and we just followed this dust trail uh, down the trail so that to get to the, uh, the spot. But the air, the air quality over there is not the best anyways. And when you are going down the vehicle and the, the dust is just coming in, you're very thankful for the air that you can breathe. So let's, let's look at James uh, chapter one. I'm gonna put some stuff up um, on the board. You can turn to your Bibles. But James one, so we have, we have here that the, uh, the author we see is James. And we know that, and we actually, through some study, we, I discovered that he is the half brother uh, to Jesus, all right? There was other James, but it didn't, it, it didn't pan out, didn't shake out uh, that they were, th this James was the half brother of Jesus. <clears throat> He's writing to the Jewish believers who are scattered abroad, abroad. Let me, uh, so this is to believers. So if you're a Christ follower today, if you're a born again Christian, you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, then um, this, is, this is who we're speaking to. Um, he is speaking to believers. I'm getting there. I really know where it is. Okay, so this, this letter, very, uh, very first verse says, this letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Greetings. So he's writing to Christian believers, Jewish believers that are in the, the 12 tribes that are scattered. So we have that context, we have that setting, we know what's going on. And then he says, which we've already looked at this verse, where he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way. Now, I, I notice here that um, he says, when, when troubles and trials come. Uh, I like this, this version because it's like, not if, it is when. Uh, so when troubles come your way, not if. <coughs> So let's look, I want to look at uh, a few other versions. I'm going to bring them over here. It says, the NLT says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. My brethren, that's NLT, and then uh, NIV, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I'm um, sorry, that's New King James Version. And NIV is consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Uh, and ESV says, count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds. So obviously the common denominator here is that there will be trials, and to consider it a uh, great joy, count it all joy. And, and so you, you think about that, and I don't know how much you've thought about that, but I've thought about it a lot this last month or two. And it's like, how could, it's almost like an oxymoron, you know, it's almost like, like I'm in a trial, and how in the world can I consider this joy? Like, I've been through some, you know, 60 plus years, I've been through some deep stuff, and some deep waters, and I, you know, sometimes I wasn't sitting there singing the Halloween chorus when, you know, things were really, really rough, when there's a death in the family, a loved one, or... You know, you're going through these deep waters, and, and I don't think James is trying to portray here that um, that we have this joyful, you know, running around, lifting our hands, saying, praise Jesus, you know, uh, I'm in this horrible trial. I think it goes a lot deeper than that. So, the testing of our faith will produce, as we see in those last verses, first it's going to produce endurance. Um, the different translations come up with pretty much the same context and the same meanings, but it's producing endurance. And what do you think of when endurance? Well, 
you know, you think of the guy climbing a mountain or, uh, that, or these guys that do the, uh, the marathons. What's the ones that they, they go for hours and hours? What's the one? Somebody help me out. Yes, try to have one. Yes, the, the ones that just, you know, they swim 200 miles and they jump on a bike and go 1,000. And then you know, I'm exaggerating, obviously. But I mean, it, it might as well be in my case. It's like, no, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but there's, a, there's an endurance. So you're seeing, you're seeing here that the other word was steadfast. So endurance, steadfast. And so the testing of our faith will produce these things, or should produce these things. This is to believers. So we should build that endurance. We should build that steadfastness. And we also should, it's going to produce perseverance. You know, I, I really wish that... Uh, you know, I, I just wish that the younger generation today could could just grasp a hold of, of these things of you know endurance, steadfastness, and perseverance. And um, one little thing goes wrong, and, and even in adults today, unfortunately, one little thing goes wrong, and they just throw their hands up, said, "Done, I'm out of here. I, I, I no, don't want to do it. Don't want to do it." So the testing of our faith will produce. The endurance, the steadfastness, the perseverance, and here's a good one, patience. All right. Um, you ever feel like you're you're getting so many patients you could become a doctor, right? I mean it, it just sometimes it just you know, you just wonder like what is what is going on? Like I'm just getting tested and tested and and uh, you know the, the patience level is just and the older you get, okay, the patience can decrease also. Not to discourage you, but, um, you know, we have 14 grandchildren. And uh, when they get together, or a good part of them, uh, boy, it can be a lot of fun, but a lot of whatever. Just, you know, pulling here, jumping, and whatever is going on. And uh, it's just like... By the time we got home from Argentina, I was like, I couldn't wait to sit down and just hear nothing, <laughs> just hear quiet. Uh, but that's why, that's why you have, you know, I told my wife, that's why we had children, God bless us with children when we were young. All right. So let's, uh, let's look over here. We're going to go to verse 3. <clears throat> so ESV says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, because in, uh, this is verse 3 obviously, in NIV it says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. New King James says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Um, I, did, I just like, I like that, uh, that translation, it has a chance to grow when you're being tested. And I, I believe that as we go through this, by God's grace, you'll start to understand that trials are actually not like a horrible, terrible thing. Um, it's actually like, do you realize like just boredom, like if you're not doing anything? Like that's actually not a horrible thing either. Um, today, we have devices, and if the device is on, Going back and forth, if the if something isn't buzzing around, then we think, oh, that's it's the end of the world. Uh, I'm guilty of that. But do you realize that that actual just boredom? And I'm not saying you just go sit in a corner all day for eight hours and be bored. But those minutes, those day, those times during the day, you're actually it's like, okay, well, um, I'm kind of bored. What do you do with that? You know, what do you do with that time? Well. Um, when you're in a trial, I guarantee you, you're, you're using that time uh, to be on your knees, you're using that time to pray to God. Isn't it interesting um, how that, when things are really, you know, coming at us and we're in these deep trials, like our prayer life does all of a sudden get corrected and get readjusted very quickly. Um, it's just amazing. <clears throat> 
So consider trials to be an opportunity for growth. Um, I just I just think that if you look at trials that way, that it's an opportunity to grow in your faith, uh, to grow closer to the Lord, to try to, to understand that God is God, we're not. God is holy, He is sovereign, we're not. That He knows what's going on. Now there's a difference between if you're in sin, you're not confessing it, you need to, uh, if you are just going along, ignoring God, you're, you're, in a, you're in a bad spot. This is not what it's talking about when, when trials are coming, when those unexpected moments and, and catastrophes happen, um, how do we react? So consider it to be an opportunity for growth. Trials also, <clears throat> trials also help us to trust God. You know, when you're in a deep trial, I, mean, I, I remember several of them in my life, and um, I, some of them, I think a lot of them actually happened at the camp, and I just remember you know, this one that it was like, I just had no clue what, how this was going to happen, how in the world we were going to be able to pay the bills, how, whatever. Um, I won't go into huge details, but I literally, I had, I was literally at the end of my rope. Um, the Lord has a way of stripping things away from you and those, um, He's not, he's not doing it to be mean, but he has a way of stripping things away to get our attention. And so that we will literally finally fall down on our face and say, God, you are God. I'm not. Okay, I'm listening. Uh, I, I remember that. That happened to me several times at the camp. Um, we had a, uh, and forgive me if I've shared the story before, but I don't believe I have in public. Uh, anyway, so we, we move up to the camp from Rhode Island up to up to Wentworth, and um, you know I'm, I'm answering God's call. He literally called. I know He called us up there. He worked out many many different things. We're there. Um, they let us. The church we were getting it from. They let us get up there ahead of time because it was going to be in November. It gets cold in the mountains early. So we were working it out with the bank for the mortgage and, and all this other stuff and. Um, we get we get up there, and the first the first thing was I like, when we went there I, I made arrangements. Actually, it's probably me. I'm getting a guilty complex now. I was like, oh, I'm going to start about forgetting things and stuff. But uh, I made arrangements with the uh, with the, the pastor of the church, and I said, okay, we're going to be here at this such such and such a date. Uh, is that okay? If there's any problems with any of your elders, deacons, mind that. Please, please tell me. Uh, so looking back on it, I suppose I should have called him. So anyways, the date came, moving truck, we're up there, and I said, well, okay. Sunday after the church, went over, walked over to the camp, stepped in the office, called up the pastor, and said, hey, um, it's me, it's Bob, okay, I'm, I'm here. And he said, like sign of silence, and right then my stomach's kind of turned, and he goes, he goes, where, here? I said, I'm here at the camp. And he says, oh, like just silence. And I'm like, oh no, I've got my wife, four kids from ages nine and a half down to three and a half, right? Hold up roots, no clue, had a successful business going on down the road. I'm up there not knowing what's going to go on next. And I'm standing there, I'm on the phone like, what? Um, he goes, oh. I, that's right. I meant to call you. Well, yeah, that's nice. Thanks. Thanks for being to call me. Well, uh, I'll talk to the uh, elders again and, and make sure, you know, it's okay. Now, we've got boxes piled up seven foot high in the, in the living room. And I already, re I already returned the, uh, the truck. And, and I'm like, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Is this how it's going to go? Like, all the way. Uh, so that got squared away. Then uh, the bank uh, said I needed a special hazardous waste study thing, uh, $6,500. Well, I didn't have that kind of money to spend. I said, all right, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. And he, the Lord worked that out. But that's a whole other story. Um, and then one day I'm over at the camp stretching wires of the PA system, and I hear this explosion. And uh, I look over in the side of our house, uh, the kind of 
brass ear is on fire. Then um, is on fire. And uh, I jump in the van, I grab some fire extinguishers, and I'm, I'm going over there, and our kids are at the door, our oldest son, nine and a half, ten years old, because he wants to help, and he's trying to, you know, rip through the door, and it's like, and, and Deb's holding the kids back, and so there's our new car, and it, the, the hood opened this way, so I'm looking around, I've got a splitting wall, and I start wailing on the, on the hood, you know, by that time it was toast anyway, so I get the hood open and I'm just waiting for an explosion even more. Things all up in flames, I get the I get the flame to calm down and I'm like, Lord, what is going on? I'm up here serving you. I answered your call and just one thing after another. One thing after another. It was like you know what, I think I'm gonna pack the bags and I'm gonna head back to the island and do my landscaping and just be a happy camper and serve in my church. You know, this is this is insane. It just it just kept going on until you know what? You know what I learned finally? It, you know, it's kind of thick up here. But I learned that what God was doing through all those trials and tribulations was he was trying to Get me to submit to him and humble myself, humble myself to him. He was getting me to the point where I literally was just down to nothing. I mean nothing. And just laying on the dirt. God, what are you doing? Finally to the point, finally to the point where it's like, okay, God, I give up. I give up. You're God. I'm not. You're holy. I'm not. You're sovereign. You know what's going on. You know what's happening here. I, I was at my wood saying, now think about it. You know, I had no clue how we were going to even uh, pay for that mortgage thing. And God has miraculously worked that out. Um, here's, the, here's the new car, you know, all in flames. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly tell you, I'm going to end fairly soon, but I, I want to tell you how it, that even happened. My grandmother was moving into an assisted living uh, place, a nursing home. We gathered a bunch of stuff, went down and got it, and it had a bunch of magazines and papers and whatever. Um, and so we had, because we're up in the mountains, you can, you can just start a fire in the road, and they, you know, you just start a fire, and you can, no problem. Uh, all you builders out there in the town I was in, no building permits needed. I thought I died and went to heaven. No building permits needed. Now it's good if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, it's not a good thing. Um, anyway, so I started, I burned all these like magazines, papers, and all that. Uh, we had a trash can with holes in it, and I burned it. And three days later, I'm over kicking, and I'm feeling it. Like, okay. I dumped it out in kind of the garden area. And probably about, it was about here in the back wall. I dumped it out, maybe a little closer. Dumped it out. I'm even feeling you know, like, okay, just make sure everything's okay. Well, the wind picked up that night or early morning. And there must have been just a little, little, tiny, tiny piece of magazine or whatever. And it acted probably like a little cigarette, right? And that thing started smoldering. And wouldn't you know it, the Lord literally had that wind go and, and catch red pine needles growing pine trees all over. And this section of pine needles literally went right over to the car. I mean, you couldn't have stretched the, uh, snapped the line any straighter. It was like, okay, all right, I'm gonna blow a little wind. I'm gonna put that right to the tire, and she's gonna blow. And then the car's gonna catch on fire. You know, you're not listening to me, Bob. You're not listening. So I'm gonna take away that possession that you were really kind of holding on to. And um, I'm going to take this away until I can get your attention. Now, God's not a mean God. He's a loving God. And he did that, and he does things like that to this day because he loves us. So he's not up there like, yeah, you're not sitting in your knees, so I'm going to just burn your car to a crisp. Well, I'm just an old, thick-headed crab, and, and I just needed, I needed that discipline. I needed that shock factor. Why? To get to the point where I literally was on my face and just submitting to God. 
And you know, when you get to that point in your life, when you realize those trials and tribulations have a way of working those things out, when you get to that point in your life, you know what happens? It's really kind of a, a real deep freedom in your soul. Because you know what? You know what going on after that? Okay, God, this is your camp. This is your building. Oh, by the way, oh, these these are your these are your bills. No. I was willing to work, I mean, I was working hard, I was working uh, carpentry, deadlifts, work, we were doing everything we possibly could to uh, sustain the camp. So it wasn't like I was just sitting back, <coughs> excuse me, I was sitting back just saying, okay, uh, you know, hey, I'm here, you know, you, you go to perform. No, not at all, but he, he took things away that I was cherishing to the point where I just finally submitted and so it was very freeing because I, I remember several days of just going around saying, you know what, uh, okay, uh, what, color, what color do you want that, uh, that building over there? That's your building, it's not mine, that's yours, you know, what color do you want it? I go to the hardware store, and, you know, um, a bunch of those paint, same color, oh, that's, that's what color that's going to be. Or somebody would miraculously bring stuff along and uh, that's why when, uh, when Richard Berry, when Pastor Berry comes in and starts sharing about sharing about Jesus and, and all those different sides of oh man, I can, you know, not to the extent of he, he still is living it every day, but I'll tell you, when you get to that broken place in your life and you get to that broken spot where you literally, literally just, you just say, God, I give up, I am just, I, I can't do this, I can't do this in my own strength. And that's where, that's where the world brought me and many, many, 10 years of that and continues, obviously. I'm going to just leave us with this here. Uh, trials help produce hope. And I want to leave on, a, on a, a positive note that trials help produce hope. Um, you know, if you think that this trial is never going to end in your life and you think, I am just... I'm smothering, I can't even breathe, and I, I'm just, I don't see the end of this. Then you just submit that to God. Submit that to God. Surrender that to Him. Trials will help produce hope in your life. So it will help produce, uh, I'll tell you, after that breakthrough I had up there at the camp on the mountain, uh, it was, yeah, things still went wrong, you know. <laughs> things broke, things blew up, things, I can tell you a million stories, but. But I knew deep down in my soul that I had gotten that right with God that, okay, you are God of God. You are the Lord of Lords. You are holy. I'm not. You are King of Kings. I'm just this. I'm just your instrument, Lord. I'm whatever you want to do. And it just, it's just an amazing freedom of that that occurs. So we're going to pick this up uh, next week. I want to I want to dig more to into the scriptures. Uh, I've got some some really good stuff that I think will really help you. Hopefully, we can just wet your appetite today and just realize that if you are going through a trial, um, and if you're here, if you're not a believer today, you you don't you don't have that spiritual capacity. And I'm not trying to put you down, but you don't have the spiritual capacity uh, to fight this. This is this is warfare, folks. This is a battle. And so you, if you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you have trusted Him. He is the Lord of your life, King of Kings. Then you have that, you have that arsenal. You do have that, uh, the ability through the Holy Spirit, through God and God alone, uh, to help you through all these different trials that will come. Um, like I said, next week we're going to get, try to get in uh, even deeper into James and, and uh, get through hopefully the next uh, about eight verses. And so, Lord willing, by God's grace, this can help you because I can guarantee, I can guarantee there's at least one person, two people here uh, that are experiencing a trial or you're going in a trial. And uh, I, I want next week I want to end uh, with, a, with a song. Um, I am not going to sing it, so please don't panic. Please do come. But um, the, the band leader for Mercy Me, uh, has a son and uh, he's 15 years old and he's born with type, uh, type 1 diabetes. Every day the, the poor boy has, he's 15 years old and he's had over 35,000 shots 
35,000 shots. Given every time he, something goes in his mouth, boom, the shot has to follow. So that's a trial. And he wrote a song that is so high. I have just uh, really come to appreciate it. Very uh, filled with just great doctrine and theology, but it just, it's just so deep. And you know, when you think about it, when you go through a deep trial, then you're able to help others someday. You know, if, if any of you ladies have ever experienced uh, a miscarriage, you, you can help somebody later on down the road. Whereas if you've never experienced that, and go, oh, well, I'll, I'll pray for you. And you mean well, the other, the other person hearing that, they're just like, okay, thank you. But, you know, if you can say, yeah, you know what, I, I had a house fire. I went literally through the flames. And, and then you share that. You're able to. So, so there is hope. There is hope. Trials will help us produce hope. So let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, I thank you that, um, that you are not uh, just causing us to go through trials because you want to uh, just be mean and be honorary. And uh, God, you love us. Uh, you love us beyond imagination. And uh, Lord, I pray that as we work through this, that we uh, can truly see that we can lean on you. Thank you, Father, that we can, when we are experiencing a trial, we can obviously go to you in prayer. We can, uh, we can go to our brothers and sisters for, uh, for encouragement. And God, I pray that you will just work in our hearts mightily, that we will see a clear picture of, uh, of to be, how we be joyful, Lord, when we experience trials and tribulations. We thank you, Lord, we love you. And uh, Father, I just pray that if anyone here needs any, any type of prayer or, or uh, needs to talk after, that they would just freely come and, uh, and just, just hear uh, from you, that they would uh, just pray to you, that we can just work with them, Lord. And we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.